Metabolism undoubtedly requires quite a bit of memorization, but there is also an underlying logic to metabolism, and if we understand it, it can make this memorization a lot easier. Today's video is going to focus on understanding the logic behind enzyme naming, and with that, let's go ahead and jump right in. If we look at a lot of our enzyme names, they're going to first list the reactant and then a particular type of enzyme. For example, for the enzyme 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase, its reactant would be 6-phosphogluconate. And since it's a dehydrogenase enzyme, it will always involve electron carriers, and sometimes it will also involve the release of CO2. By understanding this naming, we know a part of the pentose phosphate pathway without even having studied it to begin with. We can make some pretty good guesses as to what the other enzymes would do on the basis of this, Although this requires us to understand different enzyme classifications, there are a lot less classifications in comparison to all the enzymes that are involved within metabolism. So by virtue of memorizing the different classes, we get a leg up on memorizing the specifics. We've already covered dehydrogenase, but let's go ahead and recap it. As I mentioned, dehydrogenase will always involve the electron carriers. Additionally, they'll also sometimes involve the release of CO2, as would be seen in the pentose phosphate pathway, as well as in the citric acid cycle. Now that we've covered dehydrogenases, let's go ahead and move on to isomerases. The name here kind of gives it away. They're going to generate isomers. These could be structural isomers as well as stereoisomers, and there are a couple different types, and we'll look at those now. We have the isomerase, and an example of this would be phosphoglucose isomerase. So remember, it describes a reactant, so we would expect some sort of glucose with a phosphate on it to be isomerased. And with the isomerase, you tend to see a change in the name of the molecule out front. So for example here, glucose 6-phosphate, that's the phosphoglucose component, goes to fructose 6-phosphate. The isomerase changed the glucose into a fructose molecule. This is in contrast to something like a mutase. For example, we'll look at phosphoglucomutase, which starts with glucose 6-phosphate 2, because again, it's a phosphogluco. The mutases, generally speaking, are going to change the number here. So for example, when we look at this reaction, we can see that glucose stays on both sides of the reaction. It goes from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose 1-phosphate. Now, this isn't a firm rule, but for most of the types of metabolism you're going to encounter on the MCAT, this is always going to hold. And that's the thing. These are general guidelines, and these ways of understanding the metabolic enzymes aren't always going to work. There will be exceptions, and those are going to be important to notice as you look at the specifics. But by and large, these things are going to work. Okay, now that we've covered the first two and we have that disclaimer out of the way, now let's go ahead and look at the last one under the isomerization classification, which is the epimerase. As the name suggests, this is going to generate an epimer of a particular sugar. So for example, ribulose 5-phosphate 3 epimerase is going to start with a ribulose 5-phosphate and then presumably change it into a different version of that sugar by switching one of the OH molecules around. And that's exactly what we see here. We go from ribulose 5-phosphate to xylose 5-phosphate. Xylose is simply a epimer of ribulose. Now let's go ahead and move on from the isomerases into the phosphate changing enzymes. These are going to include things like kinases, phosphorylases, and phosphatases. We'll start with kinases. Kinases are pretty much always going to involve ATP. And so for example, if we had the kinase hexokinase, we would expect a hexo, in this case we're talking about hexoses, or a six carbon sugar being kinase. Well, we should expect to see an ATP involved, and additionally kinases tend to add phosphates. This isn't always true in metabolism, and when we look at glycolysis, we'll talk about how you can keep this straight without, again, needing to memorize all of the different exceptions, but let's just go with hexokinase for now. If we look at this here, we would expect glucose to start as a reactant, because remember, we were looking at a hexose, not a phosphohexose. And since it's a kinase, it should use ATP, and it should add a phosphate to this molecule. And that's exactly what we see in this case. We go from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate, with ATP going to ADP. Let's go ahead and move on to the phosphorylase, or sometimes I call it the phosphorylase, and that might sound really strange, but I keep the differences between the kinase and the phosphorylase straight by thinking about a fox on a rock. Well, why a fox on a rock? The only difference between the two enzymes is their source of phosphate. It's organic in the case of the kinase, that's ATP, and in the case of a phosphorylase, it's inorganic, and a rock is about as inorganic as you can get. So by thinking about a fox on a rock with phosphorylase, it helps you remember that it uses an inorganic source of phosphate instead of an organic one. Now that we understand how phosphorylases work and the difference between kinases and phosphorylases, let's look at an example. And here we're going to look at glycogen phosphorylase. I would expect glycogen to be the reactant, and that ends up being the case, and I would expect glycogen to get a phosphate added to it. In this case, that's exactly what we see. Glycogen goes to glucose 1-phosphate with the addition of a PPI, which is simply just a way of denoting inorganic phosphate. So it follows the exact scheme that we've seen for the rest of the enzymes. 
All right, now let's go ahead and move on to the last phosphate-involved enzyme, and that's the phosphatecoase or the phosphatase. I remember it as the phosphatecoase because that's what it does. It takes away phosphates. So for example, if we had fructose bisphosphatase, I would expect it to have a fructose bis, whatever that happens to be, and take one of its phosphates away. So for example, that's exactly what we see here in this reaction. We go from fructose 1,6 bisphosphate to fructose 6 phosphate. So we started with a fructose bis, it was 1,6 bisphosphate, and we removed one of those phosphates to yield fructose 6 phosphate. Now that we understand all of our phosphate-involved enzymes, let's go ahead and look at the synthesizers. There are two synthesizers, and essentially they do what they say. Now, what makes these special is that typically, but not always, they tend to describe the product instead of the reactant. So for example, if we look at citrate synthase, we should expect citrate to show up instead in the product side, not the reactant side. And this is usually going to combine two molecules, but there aren't hard and fast rules with these ones. These ones are a little bit more miasmous. And in this case, that's what we see. We see exoacetate plus acetyl-CoA going to citrate. This is going to be in contrast to a synthetase. Synthetases also tend to name the product rather than the reactant, although we're going to see an exception here from the citric acid cycle. I'm highlighting the specific exception on purpose because I want you to keep in mind that these are not foolproof rules. These are there to help you, but you can't always rely on them. They're good as a guessing strategy and a way to get started on memorizing all of this material, but they shouldn't be a substitution for the memorization of, say, glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway or any of the other metabolic pathways that the MCAT expects you to know. The thing that makes a synthase and a synthetase different is that synthetases tend to involve some sort of energy carrier. This could be a GDP or a GTP molecule, or ADP or ATP. All right, now that we've described that there can be exceptions and we understand what a synthetase is, let's go ahead and look at succinyl coa synthetase to see an example of both the exception as well as what a synthetase will do. So remember, if you're a synthesizer, you're supposed to name your product. But in this case, succinyl coa in the citric acid cycle is listed as the reactant, so that's one of those exceptions. However, it still follows the synthetase scheme. For instance, here we see a GDP going to a GTP molecule, which fits with the idea of a synthetase over a synthase. Now that we've overviewed the general categories of different types of enzymes, let's go ahead and see how we can put this information into practice. We'll start with this one here, which states, phosphoglycerokinase catalyzes which the following reactions. By looking at the name of the enzyme, phosphoglycerokinase, I know that the reactant should be a phosphoglycero, and that it should involve some sort of phosphate addition or removal because remember, there can be exceptions, but it should involve some sort of transfer of phosphate. As I scan through my answer choices, only A and B are going to capture the phosphoglycerate piece, since they mention a 3-phosphoglycerate as a reaction or a 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate as a reactant, whereas C and D are probably going to be wrong because they talk about fructose 6-phosphate or phosphoenolpyruvate as a reactant, and I would have expected that name to come up in the enzyme. Now between A and B, we need to decide which of these captures the idea of a kinase enzyme. A, to me, seems more like a mutase, since it talks about a 3-phosphoglycerate getting shifted around and isomerized into a 2-phosphoglycerate. So that one's probably out because it's the wrong type of reaction. B, on the other hand, goes from 1-bisphosphoglycerate to 3-phosphoglycerate. So here we did have the loss of a phosphate, which seems a little bit weird. But remember, metabolism can have exceptions, and it's the only enzyme that actually involved some sort of transfer of phosphate. And if you were to look at glycolysis, you would see that B would be the correct answer. Now let's go ahead and look at another example, and here this question asks, inhibiting which of the following enzymes would lead to a buildup of malate? So before we jump into this question, we need to understand what it's asking us to figure out. Here they're talking about a buildup of malate, and it has to do with inhibition. And I can think of two major ways that malate would build up. Either we could synthesize more of it, but that's not going to fit here because in this case we're talking about inhibition, and we wouldn't want to inhibit what we synthesize. The other thing that we could do is we could prevent the conversion of malate into something else. So I would be looking at inhibiting an enzyme that has malate as a reactant. Well, that's really helpful because remember, enzymes tend to list the reactant. So I would be looking for an enzyme that has malate in its name. A seems like a really good fit here since that's malate dehydrogenase, whereas B, C, and D don't mention malate, so those would all end up being wrong. And A is in fact correct. If we were to block this particular enzyme and inhibit it, then malate would essentially get stuck and it couldn't be converted into a different molecule. As always, if you found this video helpful, make sure to like and subscribe for more helpful MCAT tips, and share the video with anybody else who might be taking the test.